22, verse 66 says this. It says, At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, a question I've always heard is, do the ends justify the means? And it doesn't really matter what the situation is. It could be a, a child in school using a calculator to figure out the answer instead of doing it longhand like the teacher instructed them. It could be that older sibling paying or intimidating that younger sibling to take out the trash and to wash the dishes like they were instructed to do. Now the argument could be, well, what does it matter as long as what's asked or tasked gets done? Yet do we really believe that? Do we truly believe that the ends justify the means? Because the Sanhedrin certainly did. These Jewish leaders had a nighttime trial of Jesus. A trial that would have convinced no one that was a legitimate observer of Jesus' guilt. But the trial ignored that fact, and they declared him to be worthy of death. And then what did they do? They beat him. Not just once, but repeatedly. And if that wasn't bad enough, they spit on him. They acted like animals and thugs. And then when it was all done, they composed themselves and they put on this somber, sad face. And then they called the trial into session. Now you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, didn't they already do that? I mean, didn't they already have a trial where they just convicted Jesus and found him guilty? Well, to those who were present, they certainly thought it was official. So why another trial? You see, the Sanhedrin wasn't allowed to meet at night. They were forbidden for doing so. So this fake trial was under the cover of darkness in a variety of ways. In fact, there were two prominent members of that Sanhedrin that most likely were not there because they wanted to get a specific outcome that they were looking for. And so when it was daybreak, they convened an official meeting. And the author of this Crucial Hours series comments on their attitude when he says this about them. He says, they were anxious to maintain a semblance of legality. In other words, they were simply making forth the outward appearance that it was official. They were trying to keep up appearances. Or in other words, they were simply going through the motions. Now part of the reason that was happening was because they wanted to cover all their bases. They wanted to prepare for every eventuality. They didn't want their verdict to get overturned by those two prominent Sanhedrin members, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Because could you imagine if they went to Pilate's colonnade afterward and said, this verdict is illegitimate, it's invalid. They didn't want this verdict to be thrown, on, thrown out on a technicality. In fact, they were more concerned that it would get thrown out on a technicality rather than the charges themselves being false. And yet, if we follow Pilate's actions, he didn't care either which way. He sentenced an innocent man to die knowing that he was innocent. And the symbolic washing of his hands of the situation was his own semblance of legality or an opportunity to have plausible deniability as opposed to you know, doing what was right. These Jewish leaders had the second trial probably for a different reason as well. They didn't want to just conduct their evil business in full view of everyone else. 
But perhaps they also wanted people to applaud it and praise them as if it was good. To say, look, we were just following things according to the book. We were doing our jobs. Is there more of a noble task than that to, to do your job, especially when it comes to executing justice and upholding and maintaining law and order? It kind of reminds me of the description of the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. You remember that one, right? These two men are walking down the street. They see a guy who's nearly beaten to death, naked on the ground, and they walk on the opposite side of the road, even though he's mere feet away from them, and they don't help him. They continue walking. But it's okay, it's all good, because they got to the temple on time in order to perform their shift like they were supposed to. Because they were just doing their jobs. We can honestly say that the Sanhedrin was an even greater example of the semblance of legality because they used it to do evil. They were willing to have a trial that mocked the justice system that God put in place. As long as they held the trial, not one minute before the legal time it should have happened. Another example of this complete hypocrisy is when these Jewish leaders actually go to Herod and demand that he come out to assist them in murdering Jesus. So when they went to him, he met them outside. And why? Well, it's because they didn't want to be ceremonially unclean so that they could practice the Passover. They had no qualms about bullying Pilate to aid them in lynching Jesus. But God forbid they'd be unclean when it came to celebrating the Passover. And we understand why people want to maintain this appearance of moral superiority or correctiveness and this legal standing. It's because it's so much easier to have this outward appearance as opposed to legitimate legal standing and righteousness. The appearance of such things can, can be accomplished in part, part of the time with very specific areas of things. But true obedience, you know, the kind that God requires from people, that's full-time complete work in every aspect of life. Yet true Christianity isn't about doing things by the book. Well, we should probably pause there for a second and, and give some clarity because I don't want there to be any misunderstanding. Doing things by the book in and of themselves is a good thing. In fact, it's, it's a Christ-like thing. You know, like as a student, when the teacher told you to do something and gave you a list to do and you accomplished those tasks without any talk back or any eye rolling, or when your employer gives you a procedure to follow to do your job and you do it exactly to the exact specifications that your boss told you to do it. Or that once a week cleaning or shopping list that your spouse hands you to get done. So when we talk about keeping things by the book, what we really mean is it's not just about the book. In fact, Jesus points this out to the Pharisees and those very people who struck him earlier on when he said this, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you have life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. And yet you refuse to come to me and have life. Doing things by the book isn't about just simply going through the motions. It's not about being on cruise control when you drive. It's not about saying, look at me, I showed up on a Sunday. It's not about saying, well, I prayed before my meal. True Christianity is 
about doing things that we're not legally bound to do. I mean, look at Jesus. He was legally bound not to commit murder, which is why he didn't grab a sword and start hacking away at those people that were coming to arrest him or when they struck him. He was not legally bound to take that severed ear of the man who had it cut off by Peter and heal him. And yet that's exactly what he did. True Christianity is about love for our neighbor. It's about considering not merely the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law and the purpose for which it was intended. But those who are just concerned about outward appearances have no concern whatsoever either about the letter of the law or the spirit of the law until it can be corrupted and used for their own benefit and purpose. You know, kind of like the same Hedra. If we're truly honest with ourselves, we have to admit something. We have to admit that sometimes we're about the outward appearance. We're about just going through the motions. We're about being on autopilot instead of true obedience through faith and love for Christ and others. Jesus said, let your light shine among men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And yet too often we're more interested and making our lives look like we're living by the book. So that others will praise us and applaud us for it. Or thank us for the love that we should just show. But God, He doesn't want faithfulness and service. Just so that we can pat ourselves on the back. Or so that we can allow others to do it when we can't reach it ourselves. Jesus doesn't want outward appearances. He doesn't want simply going through the motion and practicing religiosity. Nor does he want us to cling to pride and self-achievement. You see, God saw this dog and pony show the trial for what it truly was. Illegal. In the truest sense of the word. It was an affront, an offense, and a sin against God. Not just the concept of righteousness or justice, but the God who is good and right and just. And that's the same way that he, the same thing he sees when he looks at our sins too. He knows the, he knows if we're doing things by the book or not. In fact, he even knows if our attitude and our condition of our hearts match up with the outward appearance of the actions themselves. Jesus says those who seek to be justified by the law will be condemned, that no one can be justified by that law. In fact, he said, goes so far as to say everyone who upholds this law in every regard and yet falls in just one aspect of it, one eye roll, one slanderous comment, one hateful word, one theft of the one stick of gum, one curse word, one drag, one instance of complete drunkenness, one act of total sexual immorality, whether in physicality or in the mind, just one means that we're guilty. And he says that the soul that sins dies. And he knows. Not because he has secret agents but because he's right there in the room. And yet, while that being said, God also knows Jesus. He knows Jesus' actions, which were always by the book, whether he was keeping the Passover, or whether he was healing the severed ear of a man who came to capture him. He knows the condition of Jesus' heart. He saw him doing good to others, not so that people will praise him for what he did, but out of genuine love and concern for people, even us thousands of years later. 
He knows that Jesus lives in perfect legality and in perfect love, and he knows he does that for you and me and our place. So that we would be perfect and holy in his sight. So that we can offer ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. And since he's done this for us, we don't have to, to strive for some semblance of legality, some fake persona. Some false front or mask that we put on. We already have true, genuine holiness. Because we have it in Christ. And thus we can strive for something bigger, something greater, something superior. To follow the commands of God from a true, genuine, faithful heart. And so again, we have to ask, do the ends justify the means? The problem with that is that we can't accomplish the end, let alone even attempt the means. We can't even fake it till we make it. And yet Jesus did. He accomplished the means to bring about our end. An end to our sin. An end to the wrath and that guilty verdict that we deserve. An end to lukewarmness. An end to that double-minded mind. An end to what's fake and just simply going through the motions. But also a beginning to live in true conformity with our God and His Word through that spirit of washing of removal that saves us, that makes us to be like Him created in pure righteousness so that we would have enduring peace, not this facade. And all because the innocent took our guilt so that we would possess his innocence and walk forever with him in his kingdom. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding guards our hearts in our minds through Christ Jesus our Lord.